If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. We did this interview with Ryan, and we before did it, that, I did a two-hour one on his show. Yeah, you. we had to, at one point, I came over to the studio to see what was going on inside there, see if you guys were making out, because uh, two-hour podcast. I wasn't on that you was guys. a long time. Yeah. It was, a, We. I mean, just great conversation yeah. on topics that are interesting. Well, I feel like Very we've been holding you back a little bit with the politics as of late, just because we're trying to give our audience a yeah. little bit of a break. Well, on, on this episode, we talk about toxic masculinity. The, the Is masculinity in, in crisis? Education. Education. Bullying. Oh, good. Bullying. I mean, we went, yeah. we, some people may be triggered. Maybe, maybe a little bit. And I hope so. I mm. hope this sparks some great conversation. Challenge some ideas a yeah, little bit. Yeah, I think, you know, I I, I mean, Ryan does such a, a, a really good job of ar- articulating his points. And Absolutely. I think And I think he's been doing this long enough that he knows, like, okay, and, I, he, and, and you'll hear it in the podcast, like, you know, oh, you know, he'll, you know, quote unquote something or he'll, he'll warn you ahead of time, you know, as far as something that he's going to say that he knows has probably triggered people in the past, but... I mean, I don't know. I think what it will do for sure, and I hope it does, is create a really good conversation in our forum. Mm-hmm. You know, I definitely think we'll have some good dialogue around this. I think it's a topic that uh, needs to be addressed. I think his his podcast, man, is not only is it, not only is it incredible, but I think his timing couldn't be better as far as the message that he delivers at, at this time. It's like, about how to right. be basically a strong, uh, responsible man. In society, and what that means in a time when yeah, what does that even look like yeah, anymore? Just just saying be a man is controversial. You know what I mean? So like, what does that mean? And that's uh, you know he talks about that on his podcast. He ta- also talks to people about fitness and health on his podcast. He's very very interesting individual. Great podcaster. Great podcast. To listen oh, to. Ryan, Ryan's got a book. He's got a YouTube channel that he, he does all kinds of great stuff on there. He's got courses that he does with the guys. A lot of really good stuff. You can find you can find him on his social media. Order of Man is the uh, his uh, Instagram, and then his podcast is also Order of Man, and then a, even easier his Order of Man dot com is his website. So pretty easy to find, Ryan. That's right. Now I do want to remind everybody that this month, Maps Anabolic, the foundational program, the one that started it all is 50% off. So that's under $60 to get the best muscle strength building and metabolism boosting program that we offer. We also have bundles where we combine multiple MAPS programs and discount them, like our Super Bundle, which is a year of exercise programming. All those programs and MAPS Anabolic can be found at mindpumpmedia.com. Now, if you're somebody who's coming over from Order of Man and listening to to the interview too, we, we highly recommend before you even purchase anything from us, we have all kinds of free information, free guides out there. You can go to our mindpumpfree.com and you can download a bunch of free information. We also have an app that is free that's Mind Pump Media. So if you're just coming over and you're finding the podcast for the first time and you're a little overwhelmed with 800 plus episodes that we've done, you can actually just in the search bar put in a topic that you might want to hear about or learn about. And uh, more than likely, if it's related to health and fitness, we've probably covered it. That's right. But uh, without any further ado, here we talk. Here we are talking to Ryan Mickler, the host of the awesome podcast, Order of Man. Okay. How many years now, Ryan, are you going? How, how many years? Since we started? Yeah. Uh, three and a half. We started okay. in March of 2015. That's right. So we're pretty close to the same, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Pretty close. Now, I can't remember. Do you guys, is it daily? Five, five days a week. That, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. So yeah. pretty much daily, right? Yeah. Yeah. Every other day there's something going That's on. That's crazy. Yeah. But I mean, we, when we have this- there's three of us. It's really- That's true, yeah. Yeah, it's-, it's And the, for as long as we've been doing this shit for, there's so much- And there's a lot of things that the three of us are all into- that's different. Yeah. And so that it provides so much content. That's true. That makes sense. Because everybody that we meet that are like podcasters, like, how the fuck do you guys do five and manage to do everything else that you're doing? It's like, well, this part of it is really easy. There's not a lot yeah. of preparation for us. And I know a lot of other people when they podcast, they do. They put a lot of time and effort into prep. We also don't really edit anything at all, really. Yeah. So it's just the way we record it's the way it comes out. So it gives us the opportunity to put out more and more information now the downfall of that is we we sucked a lot at the beginning like i feel like we were we were pretty you know poor at the Mm -hmm. very beginning and we've Mm -hmm. gotten sharper as we've gotten Mm -hmm. well and i I imagine too i was listening to um i can't remember who i was listening to i was listening to a show yesterday and there was four of them and and it's like ah, i had to turn it off because they're tripping over each other and talking over each other and then i'm like guys like like i can't hear one articulated thought 
mm-hmm. like help each other out, right. like compliment each other. Don't be tripping over each other. So I imagine there's an art to that. I do, yeah, I don't think there's too many podcasts that have more than two hosts that flow really well. Yeah. We just worked well together, man. It was it's, it's really weird. I feel like in a past life we were all dating or something like that. I mean, <laughs> it was definitely a top. Now. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, be honest, I mean right. last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finishing each other's sentences and stuff. So, so <laughs> stop. Stop. See, just like you yeah, said. So, so Ryan, you you talk a lot about what it means to be a man, or what masculinity means today, right? On yeah. your podcast, and I feel like that is, and I don't know. It's crazy to me that that is a controversial topic. Yeah, yeah it shouldn't be. It's not. I mean, it's 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 not that difficult. I don't think, but apparently it is. Well, why do you think? Why why is it such a controversial? What is, in your opinion, why is it so controversial to say, you know, we're going to talk about being masculine or what it means to be men or the positives of of being a man? Like, why why would, why do you think that's so controversial today? I, I think there's a lot of people that have a uh, a false perception of what that means you know we hear the term like toxic masculinity i think we're going to talk about that yeah um and so people think that maybe men are inherently bad you know and if you look at most of the atrocities throughout history they're perpetuated by men you know you can't deny that uh and so what we do is we equate some of these horrific experiences and in historical events with masculinity itself and that's a problem. Uh, one of the things that you and I had talked about a little bit ago is is a quality of outcome as mm-hmm. well. And if you look at, again, throughout history, men make more money, we're the providers, we're bigger, we're stronger. You look at just about any metric, you look at uh, business and you look at the amount of degrees and physicians and you look at these types of metrics that you're looking at, well, historically they're held by men. And so we're not looked at as we're looked at maybe more of an enemy, I guess, mm. like a common enemy as a po- that, that's keeping people down as opposed to lifting people up. And I think the exact opposite. I think our job as men is to lift others up. It's, it's a man's job to serve primarily above anything else is to serve and help other people. And yet I think there's a, little, a lot of people who don't believe that's the case yeah. or haven't experienced that. You know, maybe they've had personal experiences where uh, a woman in a, an abusive relationship or a, a, a young boy or girl who grew up without a dad or an abusive dad or dad wasn't ever around. And so, uh, so I, can, I can understand. I, I get it. I really do. I understand it. Yeah. I, I feel like when people talk about all the, all the bad things that were perpetrated by men throughout history, and there definitely were a lot of them, um, I think if you're going to place the blame on men for the bad because they ran societies, you also simultaneously then should give them the credit for all the good things, the inventions, the creations of society, the like all the good things that we may have had. And that is the controversy is when we talk about... Do you think it's that or do you think it's that people feel like the, the movement of like empowering women over the last decade or two, mm-hmm. do you think that people just think that message conflicts... I do. I, I think. I think what what I said earlier. You know, it's it's the enemy, right? Yeah. It's like there's this scarcity mindset that if women are to be lifted up, then men have right. to be put down. It's like, mm-hmm. well, why can't we all rise up together? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Like, why why can't men and women work together in our own ways and based on the way that we are created, based on the way that evolutionary we've we've progressed to highlight the things that we're good at and help each other out, lift each other up. Yeah, I, I I agree, and I, you know it's it's crazy because we're talking now in collectivist terms, right? Like men and women, and you can generally look at men and women and see differences, but when you break it down to the individual, we're far more similar than we are different, oh, right? Absolutely, far far more similar. It's when you get to the ends that you see the differences. It's when you go to the extremes that you see, you know, like for example, if we were I use I've used this example before, but if we were to take the 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 top 100 most violent people on earth they'd probably all be men yeah but if you were to ge- if you were to randomly pick you know uh 100 people just randomly men and women and you were to try to guess who would be more violent if you picked a man you'd be right six out of ten times but women you'd be right four out of ten times not that huge of a difference but on the ends it becomes a big difference and that's i think where we have the problem but even bringing that up is controversial, bringing up that there's there tends to be differences. And this toxic masculinity movement, mm. I think there's more of a masculinity crisis than there is a, a yeah. than there's, you know, the opposite. 
I, I agree. And I think that comes back to the backlash that men have experienced, you know, when, when it comes to these things. Yeah. But you, you talk about the violence and we'll talk about the toxic masculinity thing. You talk about the violence and, and yeah, that's, that's the, that's the negative side of it, except for when it isn't right. Like there's times where men need to be violent. There's mm-hmm. times where men need to be aggressive. There's times where we need to be more assertive. There's times where we need to be more physical. And so some of that is maybe, taken out of context maybe it's it's pushed a little too far in certain circumstances i won't you can't have one without the other right exactly exactly (laughs) Mm -hmm. i mean it's it's the way it's the way that we operate and so yes we're naturally going to be more violent but there's a lot of other things good that come from the same set of characteristics that could potentially be perceived as negative yeah uh i i know that we're definitely more um dispensable um as a society a society can't survive with few women, but a society well, can't survive with few men. Well, and it's funny because, and you're exactly right. And society thinks that, or, or a lot of society makes it believe, or the narrative at least makes it believe like women aren't valued. I, I don't believe that's true. I think generally we value women way more than we value men, which I think that makes sense, right? We're, we're, we're bred for war and we're bred to be dispensable so that we can protect the tribe and the village and the way of life. And that's the way it always has been. And uh, modern times has certainly changed that and made things a lot easier. Uh, but I still think the roles are there for a reason. And Yeah, so what does that mean mm. for modern times, right? Like we don't have, it's far more peaceful today. Yeah, we're not threatened like we used yeah, to. Yeah, women don't have to, or men don't have to go out and hunt their food and put themselves in danger. Women can get a job and earn just as much as men can. Um, you know, What does that mean today for a man to have all those traits and whatever like what are the positives of those today? Well, I, I think a lot of guys have lost purpose. And, and the way that we know this and we can see this is just look at depression and suicide rates among men. I mean, there's studies that suggest they're up to four and five times higher than that of women. Mm. Why? Because we've lost our purpose. You know, I, I, see, I see men who are so completely lost. They have no goal, no drive, no ambition, no motivation or purpose in their life. And then it's, is it any wonder why they're, they're, they're upset, why they're depressed, why they're down? Of course not. And so I, I think first and foremost, we've got to understand that, that we do have a purpose and maybe that purpose has changed, but we can take drive and grit and toughness and resolve and aggression and all those things that we've used for hundreds of thousands of years as men and apply those same characteristics towards the advancements in our careers, uh, the advancements with ourselves personally, uh, making sure that our, our families are thriving, that we're serving in the communities in which we live. We can use those same characteristics in much of the same way, although the the, the way that we channel them might be a little bit different. Hmm. How do we teach our, our sons to, to, to do those things. We talked earlier about rites of passage and stuff like that. I'd like you to go over the, you know, talk about that a little bit. Cause I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. Well, so there's, there's, it's, it's interesting because I, I grew up without a, a permanent father figure in, in my home. You know, my dad was out of the picture by the time I was three years old. I had a couple of stepfathers come into my life. Uh, they weren't great examples looking back on it now of what it meant to be a man. And so I floundered, man. Like I didn't really know what it, what it meant. Like, what, how, how do, how do guys show up? What's our responsibility as husbands and fathers? How do we do this? I had no idea. And it really didn't manifest itself until I got married and started having kids. And I realized, man, I'm, I'm in over my head. Like I'm lost here. And I think a lot of boys are like that. If you look at the statistics of fatherless homes, uh, it's, it's staggering. It's, it's scary even to think how many young boys and girls are growing up without a healthy male figure in the home. Mm-hmm. And so I know uh, in some minority communities, it's like 70%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the majority. Isn't that, I mean, think about that. Well, we're also dealing That's with crazy. the generation coming up now too, just taking longer to grow up period. So you have kids that are staying at home until they're in their twenties now, not getting their license until they're 20 years or older, getting their first job. Like, so it, not just men, but both sexes. So it's a combination yeah. of the two well, those things. Gotta but, be. but see, women have a natural rite of passage in the sense that as a woman becomes older, if she wants to have a family, she has a natural clock that tells her, well, I better get serious about this because I'm, I'm 30, I'm 32, I'm 33. Like I need to get serious if I want to have 
kids in a family because my body's not able to, to do this for much longer. We don't have a natural biological clock. Men can theoretically father a child until they die. So we don't have that like alarm clock that says, hey, wake up and get your shit together. You know, you, you got to get serious and build a good, you know, foundation because you're about to have a family. And we don't have any rites of passage like we've had before. So you've got like the Peter Pan syndrome. Yeah. You got dudes in their mid thirties that are just making money, banging chicks and just like, whatever. I don't care. You know, it's not a big deal. I think that's a consequence of that a little bit. Yeah. Well, you well, told me just recently that uh, the Boy Scouts is no longer Boy Scouts, right? Right. It's just, scout, no, it's just scouts. Scouts which is dash BSA. Crazy to me. Is, I like, I, <laughs> and they have a Girl Scout. It's like we're trying to make this homogenous, like every, every like men and women have no differences anymore. Well, and, and it's, you know, here's the argument I always get because I've talked about this and I talk about it and everybody gets, gets upset when I, when I bring it up. And it's like, well, girls need to learn this stuff too. I'm I'm not denying that. that that's great. Right. I think girls can learn how to tie knots and that's why we have the, Girl Scouts. Exactly. Right. Well, right. I mean, Girl Scouts they they mostly just sell cookies or whatever. You know. <laughs> no, he's right. They don't. Well, do they a can lot step of, their but, game up. But they exactly. can do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Saying. That's what I'm saying. You they don't can need do to, that. You don't need to change they Boy can Scouts. Program it better. Right. You don't need to change Boy Scouts in order to start teaching girls some of these things. Yeah. You can implement it into a club that already mm-hmm. exists. But what? But I I think the problem is that we don't have environments where boys can learn from other boys exclusively, right? Like if you think about mm-hmm. any interaction that our sons and daughters have, it's usually co-ed, right? In school, even some sports events and extracurricular activities, it's co-ed. And there's a time and a place for that, of course. But there's also a time that boys need to interact with boys. That's why I think military service is so valuable. Uh, it's why I think competitive sports is so valuable because you learn how to probably engage. more so now than ever, right? Of course, because right. it's 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 a commodity, right? It's not as mm-hmm. as as uh, prevalent as it once was. But I think to answer your question, you, you really need to know about rites of passage. You really need to understand, you know, what is it what is a man? Like what makes a man a man? Cause mm. a lot of guys will say, well, if, if you have a penis, you're a man. It's like, well, you're a male, no doubt. Mm. But I think a man goes well beyond anatomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's about taking responsibility. It's about taking accountability for your life. It's about being a protector. It's about providing, it's about leading and presiding over your family and your community. And, and that's not an age. That's not puberty. You know, because you have 30 year olds that are still in mommy and daddy's basement playing video games when they should be out working and starting their own families and pursuing an endeavor and a career. And so they're males, but they're certainly not men. And so a rite of passage is designed to help a young boy. I've got three boys and a little girl. Uh, My oldest is 10. A rite of passage is designed to help him, my oldest, for example, uh, because we've done a couple of now, uh, transition into manhood by helping him understand his role and his responsibility in, in this, in, in this, uh, in this life. And people get upset when I say role, because the, the bad word is traditional gender roles, mm. right? Gender mm. roles are bad. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, why do you think they're gender roles? Could it have anything to do with the fact that maybe we've been programmed through thousands of years of evolutionary history to behave and work and operate a certain way? It works. I don't understand why we buck the system so much. You know, it's funny when you, uh, in this is, uh, I don't know why this is controversial because this has been proven in decades of, of research that there definitely is a connection between what boys and girls, you know, tend to want to do and their, you know, their, their biological gender. Again, at the individual level, it can definitely break down. You can have, and I think they should, you should be free to do whatever you want. Right. Because here's one thing I hear is people will say all the time, I, all the time I get this. Well, I know some women that are stronger than any man I've ever met. Of course. It's like, yeah, of, yeah. of course you picked, you pick, you, you handpicked the strongest woman, you know, <laughs> and, and put her up against the weakest man, you know, mm-hmm. of course you're going to find outliers like right. that. But mm-hmm. if you take the averages, it's just not the case. Yeah, there's nothing. And I mean, again, and we can do this in favor of women. Also, you take the most empathetic, emotionally intelligent people on earth. And the most of them are going to be women. Sure. They tend to, and it's just, this is just kind of how it is. This is not, it's not sexist. It's just reality. It's objective. And it's fact. not even, it, it's not even remotely sexist because being empathetic is not an inferior quality to being resolute. For example, mm-hmm. They're, they're different, 
but one's not better than the other. Yeah. Right. And so, but I do think people should have the freedom to do whatever they want. But the funny thing about that is when you do, they've done studies on societies that were prosperous and that were egalitarian or the most egalitarian societies. For example, some of the Nordic countries that have policies that try to promote and push equality of outcome and let people choose in a very egalitarian, you find more women choose more of these stereotypical gender role jobs and more men picking those jobs. When you go to poorer countries, you actually see more women choosing more male type jobs, mainly because those are the ones that earn tend to earn more money and help them rise up. But when you go to the, when there's prosperity and open choices, we tend to generally, again, this isn't on the individual basis. This is kind of a, a general thing. We tend to choose these more stereotypical type roles where, you know, most teachers well, isn't that the, tend to be women and most... Isn't that the wage argument right there in itself? Yeah, yep. That, I mean, yeah. most women just choose jobs like that, that get off in the summers and, you know, that are... Doing- or they value different things. Like, right. Like, they'll, they'll generally speaking, for example, if you're to pick... If you had a position that required 90 hours of work, ridiculous dedication, and basically no work-life balance, like you're just fucking working your ass off and that's all you're doing, men tend to pick those times of jobs over women because we tend to have that singular type focus and will, whereas women tend to value more work-life balance, which is better, which is worse. I could argue that the balance one may, may be better, but they both, they both may be needed well, that's in the society. Thing. They're both they're I don't think one's better or I, I think both are needed. I think it's critical yeah. that we have, we have both sides of that. It, it is so, so important that we, understand that there are differences and it's okay that there's differences. It it truly is. There's mm-hmm. there's no problem with being different. Yeah, I've seen some of the negative side effects of the current attitudes uh, about men and women affecting negatively affecting both men and women. I've seen women who choose to be stay-at-home moms get hammered ridiculed, ridiculed by other yeah. women. Oh, oh yeah. You, my you, my wife stays at home, mm. and 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 it and it pisses me off when people say even women will do it to themselves. Like, oh well, you shouldn't let him hold you back. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah. she, she, she's since the time she was little, she's wanted to be a mother, uh, a a a wife, and a homemaker. And there's nothing inferior to doing that than the woman who goes out and advances her career, which is great too. Both are great. But one is not less significant than the other. Yeah, because I've seen them get hammered for that and ridiculed. Like, oh, you have a degree and you're wasting it by, you know. By raising the future generations? Yeah. You think that's a yeah. waste? Mm-hmm. Right. And then, and then, of course, you know, I think people should be totally free to do what we want. And if that happens to be a stereotypical mm-hmm. role, then so be it. If it happens to be one that isn't so stereotypical, so be it also. But this current attitude of that we're kind of, you know, pushing and promoting – I think is is making people less happy because, you know, you're 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 hammering on a woman for doing these things, and you're hammering on a man for doing these things that they may want to just do, yeah. right? And, and there's not a problem with it, right? And it may not ha- it may not be politicized, or they may not be have thought much about it, other than I want to be a police officer or I want to be a soldier, right. and a woman maybe she just loves children, mm-hmm. and, or, right. you know, and and there's no there's no other explanation beyond yeah. yeah. That just sounds good to me. Well, <laughs> I've gotten I've gotten the other end of it too because so I love kids. I love children ever since, and I'm the oldest of four. He wants to be a homemaker. And, yeah, I'm the oldest of four. <laughs> you know what? I mean, I don't Nothing know. Nothing wrong with that, Sal. I don't know Nothing if I would necessarily, that. but I'll tell you what. Like I've been the oldest of four kids. I've also had lots of younger cousins. I've always been around children. I love children. When I see them in public, I want to hug them and kiss them and play with them. I'm a guy. I am looked at differently if I go up to a strange baby and go, oh my God, let me hold your right, baby. Right, there's more reservations yeah. Oh that. no, they look at me like, oh hell no, you're not going to touch my kid because you're, you're a guy. So I've, I've been on the other end of that and it's, it sucks, you know what I mean, that we tend to do that. But I understand that some of these stereotypes exist for a reason, but at the same time, it's weird. It's like in our pursuit for opportunity, we've actually, I think we've pigeonholed people worse and we've held people back a little bit as a result of it. Like this... Let's talk about toxic masculinity first, because that's like a big buzzword right now. Yeah. What does that mean in popular culture, and and why is it in, why is it a bad thing to, to? So, so somebody asked in our in our Facebook group our definition, and I said it's it's a term concocted by 
feminists, third wave feminists, and those that have been injured or damaged by men to explain away anything they don't like or agree with. Now, that's not the real def. Like, if you look at what the real definition is, it's exhibiting characteristics that are harmful or I don't know. I don't know the exact mm. definition. But the fact of the matter is, is that words are only as powerful as the meaning we give them, right? And the meaning that we have given, especially in pop culture, to toxic masculinity is that masculinity in and of itself is toxic. That's the message that's being delivered and that's the message that's being received. I don't agree with that. I think there's masculinity and I think there's being an asshole. And I don't think that they necessarily go hand in hand, <laughs> yeah. right? Because because I know plenty of women who I would categorize as an asshole, mm. right? So it's not about toxic masculinity. It's either it's masculinity, which is serving and helping and lifting people up and using our characteristics and our abilities to serve people well. And then there's the just not being a good human being. Uh, I got the definition up there from Wikipedia. Okay, I might have messed up. Toxic masculinity is thus defined by adherence to traditional male gender roles that restrict the kinds of emotions allowable for boys and men to express, including social expectations that men seek to be dominant and limit their emotional range primarily to expressions of anger. I think so. This this that's just a bad parent. This brings me to a, a question that I was waiting to ask Ryan, anyways, which is, what do you think about this whole movement with the the cry closets and stuff? Are you familiar with? No, this? I don't know that term. Oh shit, you're not. Well, you know these colleges where they have like safe spaces. Is that kind of what it is? Yeah, yeah. you called it cry closet, where yeah. people would like. Is it literally a cry? closet or room. Well, we thought it was a yes. project, like a joke, right? but it, it turns out that somebody actually built one and people like, are adopting it. it. Yeah. And <laughs> it's popping up actually in colleges. Using it. So here's the deal about emotions. All right. Um, number one, emotions, they're not bad or good. Even, even the emotions that we think of as quote unquote negative, like anger, hate, hostility, greed, resentment, bitterness, hate, all that kind of stuff. Those aren't even bad emotions because emotions are simply indicators. They're indicators that something's working or something's not quite working in our lives. So we just need to use that emotion to be able to figure out how to progress moving forward, right? If I'm angry, why am I angry? Mm. And how can I not be angry? Mm. How can I create an, a situation or environment in my life in which I won't be angry next time? If I'm happy, great. What's making me happy? How can I duplicate that so that I'll be happy moving forward? Right. So it's not it's not negative. It's not in, that. Incredible book on what you're talking about right now, how emotions are made. And that's exactly what it is. It's just, the, the, it's a neurological pathway that's been created in your life you know, and so it's just a, it is exactly what you said right now. It's a, it's a nice little flag for you. Like, oh shit. Like, why do I get angry every time someone says that? And right. Like, to dig deeper. And that's an opportunity for growth for you as a person. So you're right. It's not a bad, it's not bad. It's not now bad to come all. back to your cry room thing. I think this is, there's this really weird trend of being vulnerable and I understand mm -hmm. it. I get it. Like, I, I, I think there's a time and a place where we need to open up. But I also believe that there's a time and a place where you need to show some... Toughen um, up. That's what it is. Man <laughs> up. Come on. Toughen up. Oh, you, you, you can't say man up. Yeah. Why? Whatever happens to Sometimes being Sometimes you have to put your emotions <laughs> yeah. away yeah. so that you can accomplish the task at hand. You know, I spent some time in the military and in Iraq in 2005 and 2006. If I would have been vulnerable <laughs> in some of those situations, You're I could have got myself killed or other people killed. So there's a time and a place for it. But to say that we always need to be emotional and like this toxic masculinity thing here, that we need to be able to express it and vulnerable and open up. Uh, no, I'm not buying that. So how do we teach that balance to our kids? Like, how do we tell, how do you tell your son, like, you know, when it's okay to cry and when it's not, or when, like, how do you handle a moment like that? I, I think helping them understand what their emotions are telling them. So for example, um, last year, my son came home from school and he was upset and I said, what's wrong? Well, he had a, he had a kid picking on him at school. And so we talked about it. Hey, why are you upset? Why does that make you mad? He, he was teasing you. What, you know, what are you going to do about it? And he's like, I don't know. What should I do? And I'm like, I don't know. You're feeling this and it's not my problem. It's your problem. So how do you think you can handle this? And he's like, well, uh, I should stand up for myself, don't you think? I'm like, do you think that's the right thing to do? Yeah. So he did. A couple weeks later, the kid was picking on him. He stood up for himself. They didn't get into a physical altercation, but he verbally stood up for himself. And the kid never picked on him again. Mm -hmm. And I saw him come home from school that day with his chest out and his head held high. I'm like, dude, how did school go? He told me what had happened. But you know what? We used the emotion of anger and being upset 
to produce an effective outcome, which mm. was him standing up for himself. Right. But as a father, and I think this is where we have potentially got this wrong in the past. As a father, it's my job to open up and communicate in a way that will allow him to experience and feel that and learn from it. Right. Mm -hmm. Versus, well, you just punch him in the face and toughen up. Right. That or might be the ultimate objective, right? Which is maybe that's the, the ultimate objective. These, yeah. So these days, that's that's typically what I see anymore. Is the answer is to back away, you know, go get help and get all these people involved, you know. Whereas now, what, what we're doing is we're pulling away from all the tools we're trying to provide our kids to stand up for themselves, right? And have confidence and be able to stand their ground, even if it means like sometimes you're going to take take a beating. Yeah. I mean, that, that God forbid, right? Because when we were in school, it was like, nobody likes a tattletale. Right. Right? And you would get your ass kicked if you were the tattletale. Right. So, versus like... <laughs> Standing up for yourself is one ass beating. Going and telling on somebody is a bigger ass beating. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's, it's yeah. a verbal and physical ass beating. <laughs> or excuse yeah. me, an emotional and, and physical ass beating when, right. when you do it that way. Right, So right. I, I think there's validity to the, the term man up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah, that's exactly what's required. Mm -hmm. We just need to help our, our boys understand when that is. Now, when you because you have a very masculine presence with your boys, do you, is there other ever times where you feel like you, you have to let them, hey, it's okay to cry. You don't have to be so tough in front of dad mm -hmm. all the time. Do you ever feel like they're trying to overcompensate because they have a father like you? Or do you, uh, you ever yeah, notice that? Yeah, I could definitely see that because yeah. I tend to be more of the, hey, let's just toughen up and right. get the job done. Um, so I, I, uh, I try to be aware of that, certainly. And uh, I try to ask questions more than, hey, it's okay. Yeah. You know, like, it's okay to cry. I can't envision really saying that, but uh, I would ask, why are you crying? Mm -hmm. You know, what's not like, why are you crying? But like, legitimately wh why are you crying wh right. what are you upset about mm -hmm. why does that make you upset what right. can you do about it what should we do to fix it so I, I try to be more results oriented and just using the emotion of being upset as a, as a benchmark for changing something in our life right i mean there, i've had this conversation with my kids and, and i explained well you know if you're if someone's picking on you or someone's dominating you or someone's whatever you want to call it, oppressing you and you show them that you're crying and that you're fearful that will embolden them. Of and, course. and those moments don't show that and show that you're tough, if you will, because you don't want to display your, your fear necessarily. If you're happy about something or you want to show an emotion because you love something, those are, those are good times to show. But the real, in real life, there definitely are times when you don't want to show that weakness. You don't of course. want to demonstrate that. And here's the funny thing, by the way, They've, they've, this is this is a study that they've de they've demonstrated many many times. They'll show pictures of men, and a woman will consider a man more attractive if he's standing stoically with a straight face versus yep. if he's smiling. Yep. But you know what's funny about that? That's not a that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Right. Yeah. You 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 started off this conversation, but like with controversial. Like, why would that study even need to be? Right. You you <laughs> don't like. Obviously, because women are looking for men who are men who Protector, behave like protectors, men, protectors yeah. and, and have a, a strong likelihood of being able to secure more provisions. Like that's what they're looking for. That's not mm -hmm. bad. That's just what it is. Instinctually. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If you want, if you're a guy and you want to get like no attention from women, just cry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't mean just cry because you can show emotion. But you cry at struggles or fear. Someone yells yeah. at you and you yeah. drive off Paper and start cuts. crying. With you. Yeah. Trust well, me, that girl's going to dry up faster than fucking... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so I had a guy in our Facebook group. He, he, was, he was asking about that. Uh, not, not necessarily crying or whatever, but something like he needed some support from his wife or uh, it was something along those lines. I'm like, look, your woman is not looking for another child to take care of. Mm. So stop behaving like a child. And you know what's sad about this is, and I, and I said something to the effect of when you're infatuation with her, the cuteness, that's what I said, when the cuteness of your infatuation with her wears off, she's going to throw you to the curb. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of guys do. They play the nice guy. They mm -hmm. play the, the, the child. Like, I need you. You're the center of my universe. And that's cute to, to women Dude, this is so, for a while. It's so crazy because I, I had a childhood call best that the white knight? Child, childhood best friend of mine and I you know we've been friends for a very long time so I've seen him date many many girls and I used to always tell him like man you have this MO 
every chick loves you because he just would worship the ground they walk on. They say jump, he says how high. And they just would talk how great it was. And it would be about six months or so. And it was like clockwork. I could tell every time. He'd meet a girl and I just I'd see where the relationship was going. And I'd try and warn him, like, hey man, you know, sometimes when you're when you're such a nice guy all the time, what ends up happening, and I know they're worshiping you and telling you how amazing you are right now, but it never ends or never fails that within about six months to a year, they all then they start punking him. Mm-hmm. And they, and it starts with little subtle stuff, little jabs, kind of teasing him a little bit in front of the rest of us and everything like that. Then it becomes like kind of swearing at him, talking down to him. And then before you know it, if he's still with that girl a year, year and a half in, I mean, she's like literally like punking him in front of and then other she probably people. ends up leaving him. Yeah, and then mm-hmm. she ends up leaving him. And it's like, dude. Well, what I think what happens in a lot of those cases is she, so we have these energies, right? Masculine and feminine energy. And we all possess varying degrees of that. That's why you see some men who are feminine men. Mm-hmm. They're not even necessarily gay. They just might be feminine men. Right. Uh, so what happens in a relationship like that is you have this woman who's who's playing the feminine role because she possesses the feminine energy. Uh, and then you have this guy who comes in who's now playing the the submissive feminine role, right? The guy yeah. like, I'll serve you and I'll nurture and I'll do all of this stuff. And then, so what does she do? She starts to become more masculine she and dominant. She takes the masculine mm-hmm. energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so now she's the man, he's the woman. And roles are all confused and everybody's upset. <laughs> you know, it's funny. That's a, it's funny. That's a controversial thing to say. But when yeah. you look at the statistics, when the rate of divorce and relationships skyrockets, when the man is actually the guy that stays at home and the wife works and is the provider, it's, yeah. a, higher, it's a higher rate of divorce in couples like that than when it's the other way around. I know guys that have made it work and and they'll they'll say, this works for us. And look, if you can make it work, all the power to you. That doesn't work for me. I I can't see how that would work. Mm -hmm. And I know it does, but I've seen statistics like that. And I think that, that makes sense based on how we're wired. And by by the way, I'm not saying it's 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 better or worse. Uh, whatever works works. Right. You should be able right. to do whatever you want, and, and couples should be able to organize that together. It's just a real statistic that I've I've read a couple times. Now, now the question is because of modern times that we don't have to hunt and kill and do the things that we used to have to. Mm. Is this the natural evolution that we're supposed to become? more like homogenous. Yeah. Yeah. We're all the same. And what are your thoughts on that? I I think that poses a very real problem because what it does is it allows the wolves to run rampant. And what I mean by that is that it could be wolves as in a potential threat of war, for example, or conflict, violent crime. Uh, It could also just be a natural disaster. Mm -hmm. These situations that just happen over time and throughout the course of history if there's not any men to stand up against those threats, uh, we we face some very serious issues. Now, I agree with you, but I'm playing devil's advocate right now because then they would say, someone would say, well, it's we're in some of the safest times that we've ever been in in, mm-hmm. in, in, in society. Like, is it... And a, our, mom, and a mama bear can be really protective too. Sure, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And we might be in some of the safest times in history, but that doesn't mean those things won't happen. Right. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean they can't happen. And when we let our guard down... Throughout history, what has happened? Right, right, and so I, I think it's imperative that we learn to be strong, tough, resilient, gritty, physical men, so that we are able to handle those situations when they arise. So when we talk about masculinity and we and we look at our society as a whole right now, what do you think are some of the things currently right now that are threatening it the most? Hmm, man, that's a good question. <clears throat> the things that are threatening society, or, or excuse me, masculinity yeah, most. Yeah, in our society right now. Yeah, I think number one, and, and Sal, you and I talked about this, but personal accountability and responsibility. Like we have, we have shifted the blame and the burden of responsibility on governments and institutions and our jobs and our wives and everywhere else that we can. And we've shucked all of that responsibility so we don't have to take it on ourselves. Right, victim role. It is victim role. And what ends up happening when you play the victim is you subject yourself to outside variables, whether that's uh, a a company that's going through layoffs or a natural disaster or your wife who 
is going through. I mean, there's so many situations that could happen when you can't learn to take care of yourself and stand on your own two feet. And do you think that that starts in, at the home front as dad and mom? Or do you think that's, you know, our schools to blame right now? Or do you think that's the message that we're hearing on TV and YouTube and shit like that? I think it's a it's a play for, for mediocrity, that it's okay to be who you are and that everything's okay and you're you're good just the way you are. Well, that's bullshit. I'm not good the way I am. That's, that's that to me, that's empowering. Mm -hmm. I know some people will hear that and think, well, Ryan, that you're kind of being harsh on yourself. No, like I expect and demand more of myself. Mm -hmm. If I'm not better off in two years and five years and 10 years than I am today, then I've done something horribly wrong. That's That's growth, right? Right. Everybody's like, the opposite is being fixed. Like I'm in this fixed mindset that, uh, you know, everything is going fine. Like, let's all just like maintain this, this status There's quo. There's no such thing. Right. Yeah. You, it you doesn't either, happen. You either grow or you shrink. Right. I think, I think you don't, there, there's the reason why there's sometimes a confusion is because people think that that means I hate myself. And right. That's the victim role. I hate myself and I'm not going to do anything about it. And I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to pretend like I accept who I am or whatever. I, I, I don't think that's the same thing. I think what you're talking about is, Hey, look, I care about myself enough to make to to want to be better yeah. right to want to be better tomorrow than I am today well and I think part of this comes from the fact that I've been able to do some things in the past that I'm proud of right like I can look back in past history and recognize that there's some things that I've overcome and some challenges that I've been able to uh, to face on my feet and that gives me hope that I can continue to do that moving forward but what we've done in society is we've stripped away any hardship any challenge any consequence to failure and so people aren't faced with certain tasks and tasks that they need to overcome. So they don't have any hope for growing in the future because they've never had to exhibit any strength or toughness mm. or resilience in the mm. past. Right. We've also, I mean, we've also made fatherhood look like, I mean, it used to be a proud, a very proud thing in a, in a goal and purpose, like to be a father and to be a good father. Yeah. Right. And now it's almost like, oh man, you can have kids, just go have fun, do whatever you want. Or- yep. You look at the media, and the dad is an idiot in yeah, almost every TV, idiot. Yeah. every TV show, every movie. The dad is just like moron, and yeah, you know, does Al Bundy's. I was just going to ask, what yeah. do you think about role models today? Like, I feel like there's just not a lot of really strong male role models in TV and YouTube and things like that for kids to even look up to. That's why I don't want my children to ever have to rely upon looking to entertainment for a role model, right? Because they're just not going to get the role model that they need. You know, they're going to get the highlight reel and they're going to get a false sense of reality or a false sense, just a false sense of purpose and in, in what, what life actually looks like. And so I try to be the role model. Like that is my job as the, and I'm going to say another swear word, as the patriarch of my family. Mm, yeah. My job is to be the example and the role model for my boys so they know how to model my behavior and for my daughter so they know what to look for in a man when that when that day comes. Yeah, and and, and I, I want to be clear too when you say that, like the word patriarchy and whatnot, I think oppressing people and being violent towards people and, and treating people like shit is bad. Of course. That's yeah. all, That's I don't I mean, even know why I have to say that. Right. That's obvious that's bad. But I think everybody benefits from men with strong char- character, responsibility, and a sense of purpose. I think everybody, including women, benefit from, from that, I don't see why that's such a bad thing. I think when people talk about toxic masculinity, they're just talking about shitty people. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's just the bottom line. It, it's that's exactly right. You know, it, it's really interesting because people, and and I'm hesitant to have this conversation because I know how it gets misconstrued. But you know, I look at my wife and I with our relationship. You know, we co we co lead the family. But at the end of the day, I make the ultimate decisions because the ultimate responsibility falls upon my shoulders for the direction of the family. And so some people hear that and they're like, oh, you're sexist and you're misogynist. And how could you, how could you keep her down like that? It has nothing to do with that. She voluntarily is part of this arrangement, if you will, because she recognizes based on past behavior that I can lead my family where we want to go together. So we make decisions together, but ultimately the responsibility lies on my shoulders. I've got to be able to perform in situations where 
she and my children are relying upon me. Now, mm-hmm. Ryan, are your are your kids too young for you to have conversations around uh, social media yet, or are you starting to have those conversations? Already? My my oldest, he's ten, is, okay. and even my my second, he's almost eight. Uh, we've we've talked about some of that stuff as well. Yeah, what do you what do you see with that, and like, do you have plans for how to monitor that or regulate that, or you know, what do you what do you what do you see when you look at Instagram and I YouTube. think the and- problem with social media, <clears throat> which is ironic because I use social media as, as well as you guys do so mm. much, right, oh, yeah. to, to grow a brand, is that we begin to seek outside validation for our lives. <clears throat> and so if my kids don't have a sense of validation that they've done it for themselves, I think social media can become a real problem. I mean, it's it's challenging enough, even if you are a confident person yeah. to, to be on social media right, like right. I am I'm confident and yet I see what you guys are doing what this person doing what that yeah. person's doing I'm like well how come I'm not doing that stuff you know mm. uh, so for me it's really about creating situations and environments where my kids can foster and develop their own sense of confidence and be able to turn inwards for their validation rather than having to seek mine mm. or anybody else's so do you think that you will allow them to have their own Instagram page, do whatever they want. Are they already currently doing? They're not, but I think it would be a mistake not to allow them to do that. Right. Right. Mm. I, I I have the same argument or a conversation about video games. Some guys are like video games are the devil and no kids should ever play video games. I'm like, well, I mean, video games are great. You know, you learn, you learn technology and you get there. There's some social elements to it. I mean, there's a lot to it. It can be taken to the extreme, just like going to the gym can be taken to the extreme. right. Right. Uh, when it, when it becomes a, a an escape from your real life, right, right. So I, I don't see any problem with having my kids engage in social media as long as I'm there and I'm monitoring and helping them understand how to use it in a healthy way. Any thoughts on like mm. advice for for parents on how to how to teach kind of like that balance? Like Justin and I love when Justin and Sal share. I don't have kids, so it's it's really neat to hear how they father around these situations like how do i teach my kids like how much time they should be playing uh, video games and how much time they should be sending sp- uh, spending on uh, social media like do you have advice for people like what you what you think or that you implement yeah at your so own? i i think there's this antiquated way of thinking which is uh, the one that i always come to for an example is like we don't talk about money like you know <laughs> oh, like yeah. like like my mom she didn't talk to me about money yeah. yep. like that was taboo you don't talk about that stuff but for me, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to tell my kids how much I make. I'm going to tell them what taxes are. I'm going to tell them what debt is. Like, I'm going to tell them if we have debt, I'm going to tell them how much money we so make. It's so important. I don't know why people didn't it's do a that. Cra- it's something yeah. you need to know as yeah. an adult. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's the same thing with social media because I'm on my phone quite a bit. And it would be easy for my kids to think, oh, I'm neglecting them or just on this little device and not giving them attention. But I help them see it through communicating with them. And that is the biggest problem, I think, but it's also the greatest solution to just about any problem that we might face is just open, open your mouth and share what's going on. So I show my, my specifically my oldest, what I'm doing on social media and how I'm using it and how it's impacting other people and how it's impacting us. I also teach him about boundaries. Hey, I'm putting the phone away, not just because I said so, but because this is a boundary. This is a space where every night we get together, for example, and have dinner together. No distractions, no devices, no electronics. This is what we've agreed to do because X, Y, and Z. Hmm. So the more that we can have these conversations about the way I I operate, not just because dad said so or because I'm the parent, Hmm. but because of of these specific reasons, they're like, oh, I, I kind of understand that. I kind of get that. Now, kids are a lot smarter than yep. you think they are. That's for sure. Now, out of all your kids, do you see any of them um, push, like, does one push back more on some of the things or the values that you're trying to implement or they all kind of follow suit? How do you feel? Well, my youngest is two and he's going to give us the hardest problem. Oh, you can now, tell. Now, he right. doesn't push back on my values because he doesn't know what they are because right, right. he's two, <laughs> but he will. You he will. Ju- oh wow! You can just tell. I know he will. Just how stubborn he is. Oh or man, what? he's. It's not that he's stubborn. It's that he's just wild. <laughs> like you could tell him, no, don't do that, and he'll like, don't touch that vase or what you know, whatever. And he'll look at you, and he'll like, as he's looking at you, like, touch the vase. I'm like, you little, uh, you know. he's gonna press. So it I all know, he, yeah. So I know he's gonna give us the biggest challenge for sure. Oh wow! <laughs> what do you think about uh, the education system? You know, we have boys are medicated at much higher rates than girls are, especially with ADD and ADHD medication. Yeah, boys graduate at lower <clears throat> rates than girls do, all the way up through college, and they tend to perform worse in test scores and stuff like that. Like, what do you think about the current education system? 
I think there's a real problem that's stacked against boys, quite honestly. Uh, Dr. Leonard Sachs has some great work on this, and Dr. Uh, Warren Farrell has some great work on this as well. Uh, Leonard Sachs is um, Boys Adrift is the book that he wrote on, on this particular subject and Why Gender Matters. And then Warren Farrell wrote a book called The Boy oh, Crisis. Mm. And there is there's some real problems. Um, I think primarily the biggest problem in the way that we can address this within the school system, specifically for boys, is experiential learning. Right. Because what we do is we put these boys into classrooms. We tell them to sit down, to shut up, to color within the lines, to don't talk, to don't ask questions, do it the way you're told. And this is the way you do it. Except the problem is, is boys don't learn that way. Right. Like I take my boys and and I and, and they're outside and they're throwing mud at each other and squishing bugs and burning ants with magnifying glasses and, and just basically being boys roughhousing and all of that. Well, what ends up happening is these boys get into these classrooms and they don't want to sit down and shut up. Would you? I don't want to do that. And so they bounce around. They wiggle. They get a little... Right. Sal's 37. I still can't get him to sit still in one of our fucking meetings for longer than 30 true. minutes. That's what I, that's true. <laughs> but does that mean you have ADD or ADHD? Yeah. I mean, I would. I, I definitely would get the di- diagnosis. You would, you would be diagnosed, yeah. but maybe it's just... Maybe you just need to focus your attention on something yeah. that's more engaging. Right. Right? Yeah, right. Maybe you're boring. Maybe. Right. So maybe <laughs> yeah, that's your yeah, fault, yeah. not his. Not <laughs> <captivating> <laughs> enough. But yeah, I, I think for I think for the school system, um, I, I really see a future where uh, apprenticeship programs actually become a little bit more prevalent than they have in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think there's value in learning as you experience the process of uh, like, how, how would you, how would you, how do you mean? Well, I, I could definitely see, um, when it comes to trades, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. that's going to become well, a significantly more prevalent than it, than it has in the past. I've said this like multiple times on this show, because like right now you see developers and you see this whole push for like, uh, you know, software and, you know, but that's such a flooded market. Right. It, it's like, it's, it, it, it doesn't make any sense for me to like push my boys in that direction. That, that market is so saturated. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and like what, what's left dude, skills and trades. Yeah. That, that is a dying thing. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's dying and it and it's it's so important. I mean, it's much needed. It really is. So I, I think I can see companies um and I don't know, I haven't articulated this very well or thought about it too much in depth and and, and flush this out, but I can see companies sponsoring and providing scholarships for well or things ex- coming up. An example of that businesses. an example that I think would be what, what I think we're seeing right now, which is like big companies like Apple uh, getting into like education. I mean, I foresee, sure. I foresee the future of like an Apple university and you get, you start off there and then you pick, you know, they have so many positions available in the, in the company and they're constantly growing. I could see those types of trades. That's the right? experiential thing that he's talking about. It doesn't even have to be the trades. It could be software. Like Justin was saying, yeah. if there's a demand for it, rather than putting you in these classrooms, in these environments Learning that, general that seem to be difficult for, for boys or for men, like here, come work for us for a year. We're going to pay you this little bit so you can learn. You get the certificate at the end, which then qualifies you to work for us. I could see that being a, a much better alternative for a lot of people mm-hmm. who may not fit in the whole, you know, school model. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. When I started in my financial planning practice, uh, one of my uh, friends who started at the same time as me, his his whole family, they're dentists. His dad, he's got two brothers, he's got two brother in laws, he's got two uncles. They're all dentists. And he, he didn't go to dental school. He was going to, but it ended up not. And he went into the financial planning practice. And, and I remember something he said, he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, you know, I'm going to take four years in this business and this is my tuition. I'm going to make a little money. I'm not going to make a lot of money, but I'm going to invest and pour everything I can into this for the next four years. And I know I'll be better off. Well, the guy does amazingly, amazingly well in his financial planning practice, just as well, if not better than his family, who's in the medical practice. Uh, because he didn't have to go in and pay that mm-hmm. tuition, and he's not coming out of school with three, four, five hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Some of these guys come out with that much. <laughs> it's insane. Ouch. Yeah, I mean, if you take like a um, like a like an oral surgeon, for example, I've seen four hundred thousand plus dollars of debt before they get into the office and start making money. You don't even own a house. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. I mean, you've got you've got you've got the education, which is great, but well, and when you look at the statistics on what it takes to even save that kind of money, how long it takes the average. I mean, we were I was just rattling off a stat to these guys. Did you know that less than six percent of America make over a hundred thousand dollars a year? 
Is that right? 5.8. <laughs> wow. Make let make le- so 5.8. That, that makes so you inflated that, out that here. That makes you poverty in San Jose. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know. Oh, I'm sure. But yeah, I mean, sure. think about so that inflated. if if 90 94% of the country is making less than $100,000 a year, but then, you know, 60% of those people that go to college are coming out of school, you know, with 30 to $80,000 in debt, like how how it's impo- you know how long it takes someone who makes eighty grand a year to save one hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars? But it's not even that they're they're coming it's that and that's a problem, yes. But that's not the real problem. The problem is they're coming out with thirty to eighty thousand dollars worth of debt with no job prospects. Right. Yep. <laughs> right, like no experience. Like if you had a hundred thousand dollar job lined up and you came out with thirty thousand dollars of debt, okay, take three, four, five years, pay the debt off. You know that's manageable. But when you come out with that kind of debt and you don't have a job, right? And you can't get a job. Yeah. That's a problem. It's right. a it's a it's a racket. It's a hundred percent a racket. Look, if it was if everybody could get a car loan for whatever car they wanted, and it was guaranteed, and there were policies that said no, we need to give car loans to people because it's good for people. Nobody would be driving a Hyundai. Yeah, everybody <laughs> everybody would be buying a hundred thousand dollar cars. This is why you have universities with fucking million dollar you know libraries and this that and the other, and your book costs three hundred dollars and. You have hundred thousand dollars graduate with a liberal arts degree, which is going to give you nothing. Right. That's insane. Right. Now, the whole market's fucking skewed. It it's is ridiculous. But it's funny because you hear people defend it, and uh, obviously, if there's when we talked about this, if you know, if you're a physician or or an attorney, you have you have to have a degree. Okay, I get sure. that. We understand that. Um, but it, but people will defend it and say, well, you know, I built this incredible network. Of other broke people, <laughs> like, like what, tell me about your network. You know, it's, it's just it's crazy. Yeah, the market's responding to it though. You're starting to see. I can, I mean, I can watch YouTube lectures in colleges whenever I want. I can buy books online now for for much much less. It's starting to change, and, and you yeah. see, you're starting to see people go in that direction because they've priced themselves out. They've made it so expensive and so insane. That you're 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 seeing now these other markets start to open up and allow people the opportunity to educate themselves and I mean I don't have any formal education all my education in fitness and health is all through certifications and courses I've taken and things that I've read and I could sit and talk with the smartest you know scientist and doctor in in, in my field and we can have a pretty good conversation on it and I have the experience behind me because I've been training people yeah. and working with people for 20 years I mean I've seen this in my financial planning practice which which I just sold about a month ago. Um, but it, it, the, these financial planners have been in the business for 20, 30, 40 years. They're, they're oblivious to what's happening. I'm like, you used to be a gatekeeper. But the problem is now is that everybody has access to the same information yeah. you have. And yep. so there's no need for a gatekeeper. And so I would tell these advisors, I'm like, look, we're, we're dying here. Like, it's just a matter of time before we're out of business and I'm going to start doing this. And so I started a podcast for my financial planning practice and everybody's like, ah, Steve, you don't blah, blah. And I started to pick up <laughs> clients that way. And now financial advisory practices pay me to come in and teach them how to do I didn't marketing. know you did that too. So you have a- no, I sold, I, I sold the business. Oh shit. And the podcast, everything all together or what? I didn't. So the podcast, what I did is in 2014 is when I launched- Wealth Anatomy. So it was a podcast geared towards helping healthcare professionals with their financial services. Oh, no shit. So I did about 20 episodes and I started to pick up clients. And then I realized really quickly, I enjoyed the medium of podcasting, but I'm like, oh, you know, I don't want to have that conversation. And that's when I pivoted and switched gears. Over oh, order, I didn't man. remember you telling me that. That's So that's how it all started then. Yeah. I was going to ask you if to kind of, re- I know we've been already talking for quite some time now, but we should kind of revisit for those that didn't hear the original episode that we did with you, you know, how did you turn this, you know, feeling and passion that you had for this, this, you know, dying masculinity that we see in our country right now into a business and a podcast? Like, how did that happen? Well, the, the podcast part was easy. I mean, I just, I, I, I started it, you know, and people always say, how do you start a podcast? You answered the question. You started <laughs> right? Like everybody knows how to, how to buy a microphone and start. Press record. Right, right. exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. So, so that's what I did. Um, and again, that was in, in 2015. And I got about six or seven months into doing it. And we had picked up a ton of traction with Facebook group and with a podcast. Like it was doing really, really well. And my wife and I were having a discussion and, and she said, you know, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the conversations you're having. You seem engaged and excited about what you're doing. It's really cool to see, 
except for you're not spending so much time in the financial planning practice, which is affecting family household income. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what makes our money, honey. <laughs> yeah, and she and she, that's exactly what it was. She's like, so you either probably ought to like scale back or figure out a way to make money. I'm like, well, I'm not scaling back. If anything, I'm doubling down on this thing. Oh, wow. And so now uh, it's now when you was that because you were just loving it so much or did you have the foresight to see kind of where this space I didn't see it. Okay. I didn't see it. I just I just enjoyed it. Okay. I had faith that I could probably make a little money and, you know, offset at least the time of and the investment of running the 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 hobby at that point. Yeah. You know, so so I had that faith that I that I could make something work. And so I was listening to a podcast. I, I can't remember the podcast. It's probably like a Pat Flynn podcast or John Lee Dumas or something. Anyways, they were talking about uh, running courses. And I'm like, well, I can do that. I'll just, I'll do a 12 week course. I'll open it up to 12 guys and we'll just like see how it does. And I sold those 12 spots like overnight, just boom, sold them. And it's a 12 week course and we get about mm, like eight weeks into it. And the guys are like, hey, what do, what do we do when this is over? When's like, the next one? Then what do we do? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Should we just keep going? They're like, yeah. So I'm like, all right. Well, then I opened it up just, just for everybody. And I mean, I, that, that's the iron council. That's our brotherhood. Now we've got 400 and just under 450 members of that. So group explain how the course works and like how, what you, I mean, obviously you were just kind of testing it out at, at first and it ended up taking off. <clears throat> yeah. What did the curriculum look like? I mean, and how did you do it? Was it like a virtual thing? Or that's you, what it was. It was okay. a virtual thing. We met, um, uh, l- let me just think about this here for a second. We had six topics. That's what it was. We had six topics we were going to cover, one topic for every two weeks. And what they would get in the, the at, at the first is they would get an assignment for that topic every every two weeks. And then we had a Facebook group where we'd have discussions about the topics and the and the assignment and all that. And then on the second on the uh, the second week Friday we'd have a, a virtual call and we would just discuss and talk about what we learned and the challenges and whatnot. That's, that's essentially what we did. Very cool. It was cool, man. And we've done a lot since, you know, since we opened it up, we, we do it every week now, um, with 450 guys, it's, it's, it lost a lot of it. It's intimacy when we got to like 120 or 30 members. I'm like, well, how can we maintain this, this level of involvement and intimacy? And so we created battle teams. So now these guys operate in 15 man teams we do challenges. We just got done with a 30 day wellness challenge. These guys all competed against each other. Like it's, it's cool. We do some cool stuff. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, now is fun. it uh, is it like a one-time fee? Is it a monthly thing? Monthly, like monthly subscription? Yep. Is that how, how it's set mm-hmm. up? Yep. Is that how it originally did it when you first did the 12 week or did you do like the first time? Like, let's just. No, I did it. Uh, well, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say what I offered it for, but it was a hundred bucks. Wow. 200 bucks. I mean, that's, you had to course. test it out. And I didn't see know, it. man. Right. I had no idea. So we, so I made a thousand bucks that first month, Right. which again, comes back to what I said earlier. I had just, I didn't make a lot of money, but I had proved that this is viable Right. to myself and showed my wife too. Hey, hun, look, this is viable. And she, she, and she wasn't, she wasn't being not supportive, but she's like, I don't know if this is going to work. Like she was skeptical. She, it wasn't that she wasn't supportive. She was just skeptical about it. And I showed her, she's like, Oh, that's kind of cool, you know. And so I try to keep her involved as much. If if guys knew how much a woman had in the say of order of man, I don't know how much longer they'd stick around. <laughs> that's funny. Well, you are a team, you know. That, that's a hundred percent right, man. I mean, we we make decisions together. I don't I don't make decisions without her because the decisions I make are going to impact her. And so she has a right to know those things. Mm. We get we get asked a lot about like building a business, right? Everyone always asks like, you know, what's the most important thing, you know, when you're, you guys are trying to build this online social media business or podcast, podcast business. And I think what you did speaks to what I'm always talking about, which I think a lot of people put the cart before the horse where they're trying to figure out how am I going to make money and what am I, you know, how, how yeah. and they're always thinking about how they're going to monetize everything versus do I even have something that provides enough value for people that they would even consider paying? Yeah. You know, do you get people asking you a lot like that are trying now to fall in your footsteps and create a podcast also and create a business around it? And yeah, if so like, what do, you, what do you tell these people? I mean, I think you're right. Uh, as far as the money thing, like they're so worried about money. I'm like, look, people are selling the dumbest shit out there and they're making <laughs> millions and millions of dollars. Like have a little faith that you'll be able to monetize this. At some point and in some way, the first thing you need to do is you need to start having the dialogue. Right. You just need to start having the conversation. Where? I don't know. Where do you spend your time on social media? Start there. If it's Facebook, if it's Instagram, if it's Twitter, 
if if you enjoy podcasting, if whatever whatever it looks like, just start. That's number one. Right. Number two is just be like ruthlessly consistent with what you're doing. Because I see a lot of people who will start something and they'll start having some of these conversations and they're like, oh, I don't, I'm not getting any traction. People don't, I'm like, dude, you've been doing it for two weeks. <laughs> right. like, what, what makes you think people are going to find you? Like, just go out, keep doing it for years and years and years. I mean, we've been doing it. You guys, what, like four years, you said, yeah, roughly? Yeah, yeah. Almost. So, almost here. So, we yeah, did it for thing. a year and didn't even monetize for the full year. That, full year, we're just trying to build authority and, and provide value. That's exact. And s- same on my side. It was about six, seven months before I opened that uh, that course up. So just have some faith it'll work. Understand what your messaging is. And and people say, oh, nobody's nobody's listening. Nobody's tuning in. That's good. You don't really have your message articulated yet. <laughs> you, you don't right sound now. all that great. Yeah. Right. Like you guys were talking about your first podcast, yeah. but nobody listens. So it's okay. Yeah. Right, you know, right. and I was thinking about that with, with, uh, my first YouTube video, which I kept on there. And I looked, I looked at it a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, what was I doing? I was in my garage and it was like, I had the camera set up on one angle of the garage. I was all the way away. And like, it, <laughs> it was bad. It was bad, but yeah. I leave it there. Cause I'm like, you have to start somewhere. Now, have you, have you, I mean, to where you've grown this thing now, are you still pretty much just you and the wife that run everything or do you have people yeah. now, a team? Oh it's shit, just, you're still yeah. running everything. It's wow. just me. I mean, I have some, some contractors. We have, we have, uh, somebody that helps me with podcast production. Uh, I have guys that help me run our brotherhood, the iron council. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's just, it's just me. And then as far as like, um, the different ways that you monetize, you know, obviously you have the, the brotherhood, the monthly that you're doing there. You mm-hmm. had a book that you did, the right? book, yeah. Um, anything else that you do to monetize right now? Uh, we do some apparel. We've got some shirts, hats, that kind of thing. That's right. Uh, that's a little bit. And then we do, uh, the, our experiences. So we do three and a half day retreats. So I have guys come into Southern Utah and all of our events are designed to push guys mentally, physically, emotionally, challenge them, test them, give them some new skills and new conversations and new friends to be able to charge forward with the, with the rest of their life. Oh, cool. So what, tell me what a weekend like that looks like. That's really interesting. Yeah. So I have these guys, they, they fly in, they fly into Vegas. I'm about two hours North of Vegas. So we, then we drive them up to a cabin that we've got in, uh, in Southern Utah. And from the get go, it's, it's physically demanding. I mean, we're pushing these guys almost like you would think of basic training a little bit, maybe not quite so intense. Uh, and then we, we, we put these guys in teams and then we let them compete against each other the entire weekend. So there's banter and they're trying to compete and trying to sabotage each other. And so it's cool. You know, it's things that guys wouldn't normally do, but they have a craving to do, a desire to do. You know, it's funny you just went there because we were talking off air the other day about what is it about men that we have this natural, like, you, mm. We pick on each other. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Give each other nicknames that are horrible. Yeah, that are fucked up, yeah. man. Yeah. yeah, screwed up, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, I, uh, what is that about us that it's... It seems like it's, it's I human it, nature almost. I, I, I do. I think it's a way to connect and, and bond, right? Like, I, I think women maybe have a hard time seeing this when we, when we give each other a hard time and we give each other screwed up nicknames and razz each other. But I, I do believe, like, for the most part, it comes from a position of love. Like, like, if you give somebody a nickname, it's because you care about that person, right? right. And so it might be a little... Uh, a little dark maybe or whatever, yeah, but, yeah. but in a way it's just our way as guys of expressing, Hey, I care about you. We are having to say, I care well, about you. I, so I, <laughs> right, I, yeah. I've heard theories on this. And one of the theories is that because women don't necessarily do this with each other. In fact, on our forum, I put, I think I did a post and I said, Hey, yeah. we t- we did an episode on this. And I talked about my buddy who owns a restaurant and I'll, I'll tell you the story because it's hilarious. I'm, he's touring me around the restaurant. And he's introducing me to his staff. Uh-huh. Uh, this is John. This is, you know, Susan, this, whatever. This is nine. You know, he's walking through and I'm like, nine. I'm, and I I'm like, you don't look German. Like nine, what, you know? And he goes, hey, nine, show him why we call you nine. And he raises his hand. He's missing a finger. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's like shit. Like, like yeah. if you have an ugly friend, his nickname is going to be ugly. Right. Yeah. Like it's real mean shit. And, and yeah. so I did a post in our forum like tell us your nicknames, and the women were telling their nicknames, and guys were they're like, cute. Oh, nice. the girls like, oh, Susie is my nickname, and, and the Bubbles. guys are like, yeah, and the guys are like, shorty, yeah, you know, because I'm short, you know, yeah. fat head, because I have a big head or whatever. And I read theories on this, and one of them is that men test each other 
with that because if you can hold it together right. when someone's digging at you, uh, then we know that you could probably hold it together yeah. when you really need to. I well, yeah, if I'm out hunting true. and that's we're in battle, you got to know this yeah. guy's. I hope if I call you, he's going to crumble. Start crying and crumble, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I also think there's an reliable. element of of trust too, yeah. like. Like, hey, I'm going to build trust and credibility because if I'm busting your balls about something and like you said, you can handle it, then I know, okay, we're cool, right? So like I I went and did, are you guys familiar with Total Archery Challenge? No. Mm -hmm. So I got into archery the end of last year and I've been on a couple bow hunts, which which is awesome. So they do these Total Archery Challenges and they took us up into Snowbird, which is the mountains in Northern Utah. And they take you up on this tram and then you kind of work your way down the mountain as you're shooting 25 different targets deer pigs that kind of stuff and uh i was fortunate enough to get paired up with a really good group of guys with some friends a business that i work with mountain ops and uh there was a a guy by the name of sydney that joined us and i've been following him on social media for a while he's a he's a triathlete he's just an incredible guy but he's a double double amputee so he's hiking down this mountain with us shooting his bow with us like doing everything Holy with shit. us i mean the guy is absolutely incredible does he have like prosthetics yeah. or? he has prosthetics um at the at the knee mm. and so he's got he had those little like flexible one yeah, you yeah, know which yeah. ones i'm talking about yep, yep and so he said he's trying to shoot standing up he's like guys i gotta kneel when i sh- when i shoot because the way that those prosthetics work is like it requires a lot of balance so he can't shoot a bow while he's trying to balance mm-hmm. his body i'm just so blown away by this guy i mean i was struggling going down the thing and i've got healthy legs and feet he's got no he's missing both of his legs so we get down to the bottom and we get like on on target number 25 is that that was the last target <clears throat> and he gets down on his knees and he's going to shoot his bow and he says hey guys i just i want you to know i really appreciate you guys he's like most people would have left me at target number 2 and he's like, but I, I just need to ask, you guys don't like, you guys don't judge me, right? And everybody's like, oh, no, 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 we don't judge you. We, we you know, we, you're awesome. We like what you do. I'm like, yeah, I judge you a little bit, you know? <laughs> and he just busted up. Like, he's just laughing, you know? Because, you know what? Nobody tells him the truth. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Like, nobody can give him a hard time. They're so delicate and walking on eggshells. I bet right. he appreciated it. He appreciated it. Yeah. Because I was willing to say something and joke with him because he's a dude just like I'm a dude and, and we just want to have a good... And now we're, we're closer because there's just a level of trust and credibility. I, like, if I didn't trust that he could handle that, I wouldn't have said that. Right. If he didn't trust me that it was coming from a good place, he would have taken offense. So I think it forges a tighter bond. Yeah, I, I, I think it's 100% true. And it's, it's funny because we know this as guys and it's an experience, it's kind of a male experience. If you're in a group of guys and one of them makes a joke or pokes fun at you and you act like your feelings were hurt and you, you know, whatever, you're fucked. Yeah. yeah. You oh, are yeah. screwed. You, they are going to now oh, ri- so, gonna ramp it up. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really, it's two reasons. One, you showed weakness, but two, really, it's because it's kind of a bonding thing. And I don't know. I appreciate, like, we talk shit to each other relentlessly here. Every I, I, day. Oh, my, and we're bad about it. Like, we'll talk shit about shit that's personal. <laughs> like, like real stuff. You know, I'm not saying stuff to Adam or Justin about things that are made up. Like, right. I'm literally poking at shit that I know is true. <laughs> and they fucking laugh and appreciate it. And they hit me back with the same stuff. And it's a great time. It's yeah. definitely a great time. I like the theory, though, you said about, like, it, it's a test, For right? Because sure. right. if you're not talking about real stuff, it's not testing. Right. But if you're talking about real stuff that you could potentially be upset about, you're like, let me see how this guy's going to respond. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay, he can respond. Cool. I'll I'll hang with him. Well, you were in the military. I can only assume that you guys would rip each other, oh, especially yeah. out in- <laughs> all the time, all the time. But it never. I, I know that there was guys who took it hard, mm. and you know what? They had a hard time making friends mm-hmm. because they weren't. And you know what? In hearing what you're saying, maybe maybe it's subconsciously we just thought, well, this guy's not emotionally tough enough to yeah. handle to be war. somebody I want to I want to maybe spend more time with. Right. On that note, what do we what do we think about like what's going on with the, the <clears throat> anti bullying campaigns? And I feel like you know that's become a huge thing now. Yeah, is, yeah. You know, it, it, all these words that can hurt you. Like, have you dealt with anything at school with your kids with that yet? Just the one I told you about earlier. Yeah. I, you know, the bullying thing is like number one. Not everything is bullying. Like, we need to understand that not everything is bullying. Teasing is just kind of the natural 
progression of life is just the way it is. Mm-hmm. So it, not everything's bullying. Not everything needs to be taken to the extreme. You don't need to ruin a kid's life because he called uh, your daughter four eyes or whatever. Like that, 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 that's not bullying. Right. It's, it, it is what it is. But the other side of it too is like, we need to be able to teach our kids some emotional resiliency. Mm-hmm. You know, like if, if we can't allow a kid to call, to make, to call a kid brace face or something without right. saying, well, he, he bullied. Right. Yeah. And, but, but not equip our daughter or son with the resiliency to say, dude, shake it off. Like, and why do you think that's so important? What do you think so important to teaching that lesson? If, if, because if that is that's life, it, not only is that life, that's like a sliver of life, right. right? Like if you can't handle somebody teasing you or mocking you or, making fun of your shoes or whatever, how are you ever going to deal with everything that life has to throw at you? It's true. I think we should definitely, and we all, and we have, but I I think it's important. I don't need to argue this to teach kids to treat each other well and with respect, of course, but the best anti-bullying campaign ever really is to teach kids to stand up for themselves. Yeah. Cause you know, who doesn't get picked on the kid who's confident, Mm -hmm. assertive, it knows what he's doing, can defend himself verbally, physically, if needs be, that kid doesn't get bullied. Mm-hmm. The kid that gets bullied is the weak, passive kid who maybe mom and dad never taught him any toughness. I remember when uh, it, when I was in, I must have been in fifth or sixth grade. I think I was. I got into a, a, a quote unquote fight with another kid. And I say quote unquote fight because it was like a pushing match, you know, mm-hmm. in school. And we got, both of us got sent to the principal's office and we got scolded. And I think we got sent home for that day or whatever it was. And I thought my mom was going to be pissed or she was going to call a school and she was going to get upset with that kid's parents. But she enrolled me in karate. Oh, wow. <laughs> like that was her response. It's Did like, you oh, you're going to get, you're going to get bullied or picked on. Or you're going to get in fights. Well, okay. You need to know how to defend yourself right. and handle yourself. So she enrolled me in karate. Like that to me was the appropriate response. Yeah, I, I went to a junior high that was just lots of gangs. It wasn't the greatest school at all. <laughs> and these guys would walk around and they would, you know, they'd, they'd bully and punk people and people would be afraid. Mm-hmm. And they they did it to me. I had this, uh, you know, I was in the line at the water fountain, the kid cuts in front of me. And I had about 30 seconds to think about what was going on. Like this kid's cutting in front of me. He's got all his buddies over there. They're, they're in their little gang or whatever. Am I going to let him just do that? And so I stood up for myself and I got in a fight. I got jumped twice by these kids and then they left me alone. And I think it's because they were like, this is way too much trouble. We're not going to fuck with, he's going to stand up for himself every time. Right. We're going to kind of leave him alone. Now, of course, there's very dangerous situations. Well, nine times out of 10, those people that are picking those fights don't really want to fight. Mm-hmm. Most of those kids that are trying to bully and start things, yep. they 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 don't really want to fight. They just want to assert themselves and 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 impress you. It's not really like and so when you actually fight back, they're like, oh shit! Like I didn't I really, don't want to. Do I didn't really want to get hit. Well, it's this. and it's human nature too is the path of least resistance. So so bullies, what do they want? I, there's a thousand things they could want, but they're after something and and they want to get to it the quickest and most effectively and efficiently as possible. And you represent an obstacle, mm-hmm. right? But little Johnny next to you, we can pull him over, but you can't take you, right? So we're just going to take the path of least resistance. We're going to go that way and stay yeah. that way. Yeah, you just got to teach them, teach them to stand up for themselves, be assertive, and uh, you know, stand your ground. Doesn't mean you have to be violent, but if definitely, here's the deal: they, there needs to be a threat of, uh, there needs to be that threat there for people to respect you. Like, yeah. Otherwise, words mean nothing. If you don't have teeth. It doesn't mean shit. This is the reason why, fuck, man, this is the reason why we have a Second Amendment. It's like that Second Amendment gives all the other Bill of Rights teeth. Without right. that, they don't really need it. What's freedom of speech if you can't, there's no threat behind, oh, if we take it, what's going to happen? Right. You know, and that's right. just that's that's just life. And if you you don't learn that skill, you're going to get bullied at work as an adult. You get bullied in life by people all the time. And and yes, I understand shit happens and I understand things can be very violent. You can be smart mm-hmm. about it. And we definitely should teach kids to not be assholes. But one of the best antidotes to that is just stand up for yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a, a Jordan Peterson quote, and I'll probably butcher it. So I'll just par- paraphrase it here. He says, you know, uh, something along the lines of a nice man is not a good man. A good man is a violent man who knows how to control it. Mm-hmm. And that to me makes makes a better man is somebody who a, a, a man who's capable of displaying violence and aggression and dominance and all those things that he may need to 
but knows how to control it and how to use it. Well, oh, the baddest dudes I ever met were like that. The baddest mm. dudes that most confident, yeah, most are were the ones that calm, relax, <laughs> don't freak out, don't act all yeah. emotional, don't get all angry, don't bully, don't do any of that stuff like that. Yeah. Because yeah. deep down, they're a badass. Yeah. They need I to ex- be. I examined that that quote quite a bit because when I first heard it, it was confusing to me, and and I, I understand now what it means. It, what it really means is, and here's another way of explaining it. When you have a choice between two decisions and one's the right decision and one's the wrong decision and you choose the right decision because you're afraid of the punishment you may get for making the wrong decision, that doesn't make you righteous. It makes you a coward. Hmm. The, the, the truly righteous individual is the one that makes that knows that they can choose the wrong decision and still decides to choose the right way. It's the same thing with... It's the same thing when you see men who are respected in high positions who have access to all these women, for example, but they choose to not be with them. They could if they wanted to, but they choose to be with just one. And those are the guys that other men tend to respect. Sure. Like he's got the choice, but he chooses not to. Yeah, he shows if your you're strength. a guy that isn't with a lot of women and is, is you know, very, uh, you know, what's the word? Um, Promiscuous. You know, you're very faithful to your girl, oh. but it's because you can't get other women. Yeah. That doesn't make you a, a good person. It's just because you <laughs> can't. Not your, available. That, yeah, no yeah. other options. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I think... And that's what it means. It means literally like, you know you have the... You can defend yourself violently. You can be tough if you need to be, but you choose not to. Mm-hmm. Not because you're afraid or anything else, but because you choose the right, do the right thing. And that's yep. a good person. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And I, I think too, this this is really to come back to what we were talking about earlier, why fatherhood is so, so important. Because as I was growing up without a father, I was weak, I was passive, I was scared a lot. I avoided altercation and conf- altercation and confrontation. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from the fact that I was raised primarily by my mother. You know, she did a, a wonderful job on her own. She was working two, three jobs at a time to make sure ends uh, ends were being met. But she even recognized that she could not help me be fully a man without getting another man involved. So mm-hmm. she got me involved in sports. I joined the military because I needed that. If I would have had, I think, more of a fatherly type figure in my life, I would have been more confident. I would have been more assertive because it wasn't always about nurturing in, are you okay? And how can we make this good for you? Which is what my mom provided. And you need to have that. You need to have it. Yes. But you also need the side, which is like, you are okay. Stand back up and let's get the job done. And I didn't really have that growing Mm, up. And I think it manifested itself in a lot of weakness in in my early years. So true. I I know you, you talked a couple of times about serving in the military and I I did want to talk about another alarming statistic uh, that has to do with men, but in particular, uh, in men that serve, I read a statistic, and I th- I'm not sure if it's true that more <clears throat> more men die, uh, more men who've served in the military die of suicide than they do in in combat. I would not doubt today. that at all. Wow. Yeah. So, why do you think the suicide rate is so high, especially among men, and especially among men who've served in 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 times of war? Uh, I think it comes back to a conversation. I can't, we, we've done so, we've talked so much today. I can't, I can't remember when we said this, but it comes back to uh, purpose. Mm -hmm. So what, when, when you're in the military, you have purpose, you have clarity of purpose. You know what the objective is in a lot of ways. You're told what to do, why to do it, how to do it, when to do it. And so it's very clear. It's very focused. Uh, A lot of soldiers and Marines uh, and, and just our veterans in general define themselves by them being a warrior and that's how they know themselves to be then they get out of the military and what happens they're no longer a warrior right they no longer have anybody telling them what to do and when to do it and why to do it and how to do it they feel lost and they're lost so i work closely with a company called uh, it's not a company an organization that's a it's a nonprofit. it's called american dream you and their mission is to help integrate and transition our nation's warriors into civilian life using the tools and the skill sets and the characteristics and virtues that they have developed and honed in their time in the military service and then helping them find their quote unquote next mission. And I think that a lot of military members have a hard time finding that next mission. And we talked about it. Every Mm -hmm. man longs for a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to rescue. And without some of those elements, it's very, very easy to get lost 
and become helpless and depressed and ultimately suicidal. Mm. It's unfortunate. I think the answer to that is helping more military members find their next mission. Do you think it's similar to like what we see with like even like celebrities, right? That especially ones that were become a celebrity at an early age in their whole <laughs> life. They identify as this famous person and then that kind of goes away, it fades away, and then they no longer know who they are, what they do. Is it, it's that you lack it's, of purpose. Well, and it's and again it comes back to the validation thing. Like if you if you're if you're defining yourself by some outside validation or outside circumstances, all of that can be stripped away from you. Mm. Like you guys have you guys read uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankel? Oh no, no. Mm. It's a book, it's on my list though. Oh, read that book. I mean, he he he's a Holocaust survivor. And uh, he's a, a psychologist, I believe. And he talks about the fact that everything can be stripped away from you, right? Like your freedom and, and, and your dignity in a lot of ways. I mean, there's so much that can be taken from you and your titles and, and your money and your wealth and all of the, your family, all these outside circumstances that you say you value. But there's, there's got to be something that can never be taken away from you. It's your purpose. It's your meaning. It's how you show up. And, and it, it's the same regardless of what environment that you're in. Even in the, one of the most horrific environments that you could possibly imagine. And it, it's a fascinating, fascinating book. You, ought to, you guys ought to read it. It's, yeah. it's really good. I'm going to check that out. I've yeah. heard of it, yeah. yeah. Well, shit, man. You ha- you're probably one of my favorite people to talk to. Right on. Yeah. You say that to all your guests. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I actually don't. Uh, I've said it to a couple, but yeah, you, it, it's it's great talking to you, man. I, I feel like we should do this again. Let's do it. Yeah. I'm, I'm open for, for sure. For yeah, sure. I appreciate you coming on the show, and thanks for so having me. I was going to work on his beard. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, you have a very healthy it's beard. It's coming in. Yeah, yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on, man. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.